podcasts on unctv.org are made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNCTV. Not far from Granite Quarry, in a wooded Rowan County setting, an old stone house rests in the late autumn dusk, marking the procession of sunsets and sunrises, as it has for going on 250 years. The house originally was part of a busy homestead settled by a German immigrant to Pennsylvania named Michael Braun, who made the difficult trek down the Shenandoah Valley with his family to carve out a new life in the wilds of Carolina, where he became known as Michael Brown. In short order, Michael Brown began building an eight-room, two-story home in keeping with his station as a successful wheelwright, printer, and farmer. It was a fabulous house, more befitting Philadelphia than the North Carolina backcountry. Luxurious, in fact, compared to the one or two room cabins in which most North Carolinians lived. The house was constructed from blocks of granite two feet thick, 3,500 tons of it, quarried nearby, one of three stone colonial era structures built by German settlers in the county. The appearance of the Michael Brown house reflects Brown's experience as a young boy in Germany. The facade has an asymmetrical balance with four openings on the lower story and complementing openings on the second story. The facade features blocks that have been cut and finished for a polished appearance with more irregular masonry on the sides and back. And there was one exterior embellishment that astonishes even to this day. The most unusual thing about the house and what sets it completely apart from other houses of the period and frankly other houses of, of 18th century North Carolina is that Michael Brown inscribed his name, that of his wife, and the date 1766 on a panel between the windows on the upper story. And then the series of letters are said to reflect the names of his children. Or possibly the first letters of words in a German prayer of thankfulness for having completed construction. The home's original setting likely was meadowland, bordered by woods, where Brown and his family would have grown food and hunted some of their provisions. It was a farm, which today has grown back over. I would like to know what the complex looked like. I mean, where this house, how the outbuildings, slave quarters, barns, agricultural buildings, fields, how they related in the landscape to this house. At present, we know virtually nothing. The house has stood essentially alone for 150 years. Especially considering the neglect it suffered after leaving the Brown family's hands. At one point, there was even talk of grinding its granite blocks up for roadbed gravel. But mostly, the house just deteriorated, and nobody, it seemed, could quite afford to restore it. When the house fell into disrepair, it became a destination for people who wanted to party. People would get in their buggies, we're told, and drive out here for a barbecue. They tore up floorboards uh, to burn them, and part of the roof was missing. There was a big hole in the back of the house. Finally, in the 1950s, the Rowan County Historical Association acquired the property and undertook the monumental task of repairing the place and reclaiming the graveyard across the road from the weeds where Brown likely is buried along with his wife, Margarita. They hired Frank Horton of Old Salem fame to actually uh, restore the house. And in 1966, on the house's 200th anniversary, the house was open to the public. The museum loves to showcase this historic property. We call it the Crown Jewel in Rowan County. Inside the house, visitors get an up-close and personal look at how a prosperous 18th century North Carolinian would have lived. The parlor, interestingly, holds a variety of simple things that any family would own although the mere quantity of these belongings would mark the home as that of a relatively wealthy family. And of course, there was a family Bible. The Bible belonged to Michael's son, Peter, 
It is in German. All the books in this house, in fact, are in German. They did have to swear allegiance to the crown. Yes, absolutely. And in the parlor, you'll see two portraits. Our school children walk in and think, oh, there's George Washington. No, George Washington was not the monarch of this country when this house was built. Uh, King George III and Queen Charlotte were, and these portraits are of them. You'll notice reading glasses laying here. Glasses were so small because glass was very expensive. In fact, people didn't have mirrors. They couldn't afford glass for their windows. They certainly could not afford mirrors. This house does have glass windows, okay? They are original to the period, not original to the house. Most people did not live in houses this size. Another scarce feature in this house and other homes of the time was closets, and the reason might surprise you. Taxation was horrible. We think it's bad today. It was bad in earlier centuries. Folks were taxed on the number of rooms in their home, and a closet was considered a room. This appears to be the master of the house, Michael Brown about to sit down to a home-cooked meal, which was pretty much all there was back then. You may have noticed Mr. Brown scooping up hot embers. They were used to heat the dining room by way of an oven-like device built into the wall. And right beside of it is a small hole cut into the room that is actually the nursery so that the heat from that hot iron could go into the nursery. There are two well-preserved rooms upstairs, a bedroom, and a workroom where overnight guests would stay. In the back corner rests the massive loom. On display in this room is a wonderful dress worn by one of Michael's granddaughters. And it was woven probably here on, on the loom in the house. And it's made of Lindsay Woolsey, which is a, a mixture of flax and wool. A small room downstairs displays the cradle Michael used for his children and grandchildren. If you were not a baby brown back then, you slept in a rope bed. This wooden key was used to tighten the ropes and keep the bed from sagging. You've heard that uh, old saying, sleep tight, don't let the bed bugs bite. They had straw ticks quite often, and bugs love straw. So they would put herbs, um, usually tansy, which would repel the bugs. And of course, the house was lit by candles. Day's end is at hand, and the old stone house prepares for another night alone. But it won't be long before dawn comes calling, and it's quite possible that the new day will be full of people and activity that Michael Brown would have been astonished to see. Would he also be amazed to see that his house is still standing eight generations later? Don't think so, because he knew these stones were set to last. Podcasts on unctv.org are made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNCTV.